The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to the first of what will be three webinars in the GSA Need to Know webinar series, which tackles some of the hot topics in aging today. My name is Barbara Resnick, and I'm currently the president of the Gerontological Society of America for another month or so. I'm pleased to be joined by four experts in the field and GSA leaders who I'll introduce in a moment. Just as a housekeeping note, this webinar will be recorded and shared after the conclusion of the session. GSA will also be tweeting this webinar using the hashtag GSA Trends 2017. Feel, feel free to tweet along with us and feel free to share the information and encourage your friends to uh, take a look at the webinar after the fact as well. GSA is really pleased to uh, present this first of three in, uh, three in a series of webinars this fall as a way to really keep us connected in the absence of our usual annual scientific meeting. The webinar topics were picked after surveying members this summer, and the overwhelming number one selection is where we're actually starting today top trends in aging. This year, GSA produced four trend reports that came from each GSA section chair. We're really lucky to have gathered these volunteer leaders today as our panel for the discussion about the trends in the field of aging. Our speakers today will be discussing topics as a panel, and we hope this leads to a really lively discussion and interaction with you as we move forward. I'm going to ask um, the, each panelist to give a brief introduction about themselves and the future of gerontology or geriatrics and what keeps them up at night. We're going to actually start with Health Science Section Chair Tomas Gribling. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Tomas Gribling. Uh, thank you, Barb. Um, I'm a urologic surgeon and the Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education at the University of Kansas School of Medicine in Kansas City, um, and have the pleasure of chairing the Health Sciences section this year. Uh, much of my work focuses in aging and geriatrics, voiding dysfunction in older adults, and quality of life, and then also healthcare education as it relates to aging and geriatrics. And I would say there are three sort of things that I think about in this topic area that keep me up. The first is demographics. Uh, we're all aware of the burgeoning growth of older adult populations, uh, both in the United States and around the world. And this is really going to increase our needs for healthcare providers uh, across all disciplines. And most research now shows that we're not really keeping up with that, um, that we will need to significantly expand our workforce uh, to help care for patients and, and older adults in the future. Uh, the second is the growing uncertainty about healthcare coverage, uh, particularly with the debates in Congress um, and at a national level about uh, the different types of, of health plans, the Affordable Care Act, possible repeal or replacement, uh, and there are just so many questions that are unanswered. And a large part of that really affects how will we provide care for our growing older adult population. Uh, so a lot of uncertainty there and a lot of uh, questions about what that future looks like. Um, the one thing that doesn't keep me up as much at night that I'm excited about is there's been great uh, advancement and growth in our science and our understanding of many of the biological processes and healthcare processes uh, that affect aging. So I think, you know, on a research and discovery standpoint, we're really moving forward, and I think that's terrific. Thank you, Tomas. Um, next, we're going to move on to Behavioral and Social Sciences Chair, Carl Pillemer. Hi, and welcome everyone to the webinar. I think this is a terrific kind of event for us to be having. Uh, as noted, I'm the chair of the BSS section. I'm also a professor of human development at Cornell, and I have a faculty appointment in the Division of Geriatrics at Cornell's Wild Cornell Medical College, uh, and I've been doing this for approximately 35 years or so. Uh, and in terms of what keeps me up at night, I'll do it as a 1.5. Uh, really, the thing that keeps me up the most, and in which I sometimes feel like I'm in one of those dreams where you are yelling and no one can hear you, 
um, is that we are sitting on an explosive epidemic of Alzheimer's disease that it's impossible to get anybody um, in a policy world or a political world to pay any attention to, given the lack of, you know, treatments or known ways uh, to prevent it. And this is happening at the same time that family structures are changing, uh, that are going to limit the kinds of family care resources that the boomers will have, and problems are mounting with the shortage in the professional care workforce. So I don't use the word crisis lightly, but if we don't plan for what's going to be a, an enormous upsurge in people with dementia, I think our society is going to be in trouble. Um, and we need to bring, bring both policy resources and resources uh, and research resources together to meet that challenge. Um, and my point five is an obvious one to GSA members. I stay up late at night so worrying about our, especially the federal funding for the research infrastructure that if it is greatly threatened is going to uh, diminish the careers, especially of a lot of young people trying to start out and make new major scientific discoveries in this area. And that's it for me for the moment. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. And last but certainly not least is the chair of the Social Research Policy and Practice section, Kathy Sykes. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, for the, almost the past three decades, almost as long as Carl, I've been working in public service in Washington, D.C. I was on the Senate Special Committee on Aging. I worked in the office of Congressman David Obey on appropriations at the Centers for Disease Control, at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. But for the last 19 years, up until the end of August, I've been working at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I just retired, and the last project that I was working on had to do with uh, wildfire uh, and the health effects on older people. Um, as a retiree, I'm going to remain active in aging, the environment, and public health issues. And the issues that keep, keep me up at night are uh, three. Uh, the first is the health consequences of climate change. It, it very much concerns me about um, the growing problem in this country and obviously the lack of response from this administration to address the problem. Um, the assaults on the Affordable Care Act that I think has already been um, raised and obviously the importance that the, that the Affordable Care Act is, and also doing more for those who aren't covered by the act or issues such as long-term care that isn't, uh, we haven't gone far enough there yet. And finally, the income and health inequalities in our country that continue to grow, that could take policy changes to uh, uh, lessen those gaps and address the needs, especially as people uh, advance in age. And Barb, this is Kelsey from GSA. I'm happy to report that um, our BS Chair Yonko has joined the line. Thank you so much. So next, Kathy wasn't last or least, neither is Yanko, and we're going to move on and ask him to provide us with his thoughts on what keeps him up at night. Hi, so, uh, so um, um, to introduce myself, I'm a department chair of, uh, of the Department of Immunobiology and the co-director of the Arizona Center on Aging at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, before that, I uh, did my uh, uh, both of my degrees in my native Serbia, uh, then Yugoslavia when I did them, and uh, I moved to the U.S. to do my postdoctoral research at Scripps, and then I held uh, faculty positions at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, Oregon Health and Science University, and now here in Arizona. Um, I am uh, uh, dominantly researching the aging of the immune system, but also uh, the ways in which biology of aging can help increase uh, lifespan and health span and in particular health span and uh, the things that uh, keep me up at night uh, would be again three and some of them are concordant with some of what you have heard before um, number one uh, is the uh, you have heard uh, uh, from from uh, Thomas how much we've made progress in terms of scientific discovery but that, as Carl has mentioned, has not really been followed necessarily by the um, increase in funding. Um, Alzheimer's is the only area that is receiving 
some reasonable funding expansion, whereas the rest of uh, aging research is really not. Uh, and I feel that we're at a pretty precarious position, both in terms of uh, losing a cadre of young and super talented investigators that are looking at that situation, figuring out, well, you know, there's just no future in this because we're not going to be supported and we cannot do this vital research uh, and they're dropping out of the workforce, as well as more established investigators where several of them had to even close their laboratories. So that's, that's one big thing, uh, which goes uh, concurrent with really trying to convey to the nation how close we are to making major improvements in um, health span and, and, and lifespan extension, but particularly health span uh, using a combination of biological and other discoveries. That I think is one of those parts where uh, we as scientists are, um, you know, need to get into the public arena much more than we ever did. Uh, the second thing that keeps me up at night is uh, making sure that we, um, in the in the area of, of aging, manage to cross the barriers of our individual disciplines and talk about these issues that are common to us, and then be able to 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 both perform research and help people in practical ways to uh, really benefit from what we have in individual disciplines. We still have. Uh, language barrier, you know, even between like say health sciences, but biological sciences and, and even more so between uh, other branches. And so that requires continuous work and continuous vigilance. And the third thing that I would single out, um, you know, like Carl has mentioned for, for Alzheimer's, I'm really concerned about frailty. Uh, and frailty is a syndrome that sits about 30, 35 years behind Alzheimer's in people's understanding of how pervasive it is. But the incidence is very similar to, to Alzheimer's. And this is the phenomenon where people lose muscle mass and other things happen to them. And, uh, you know, the first thing that's going to happen, it's an adverse event that's going to happen, can really push them over the, over the border where they have very, very bad health outcomes. And uh, convincing biologists to tackle that and try to understand the molecular basis of frailty has been really difficult because frailty itself has been very difficult to, um, to define unambiguously. And so I think we have yet another uh, tsunami, yet another catastrophe of Alzheimer's proportions. Numbers are very similar in people over 85 and 80 and, and so forth, and yet we're not uh, really hitting it uh, research-wise nearly as hard as we should. Thank you so much. So I want to um, move us now into beginning some questions that are sent by our GSA members previously. I would also like to just take a, a moment and thank all four of our leaders here for their service to GSA this past year and for being part of the, the webinar and throwing out those somewhat depressing, but uh, very good and, and thoughtful, uh, keep you up at night ideas. If uh, you have questions from the audience you didn't pre-submit, but you have questions currently, Feel free to use the Q&A functionality to submit your questions, and we'll be able to take them live as we have time at the, uh, towards the end of the webinar. So uh, with regard to discussion questions, the first is technology has an immense promise to solve some of the key problems in aging, but many questions remain about how technological solutions ranging from things like smart homes to wearable devices to apps that help manage chronic conditions can be integrated into older, older adults' lives. What is the role for gerontology in creating optimal technological interventions? And I'm going to ask Carl if you'll start us off. Sure, thanks. And I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say, too. And, and I do want to say that Liz Thing there, what keeps everyone else up at night, I found myself saying over and over, gosh, I wish I'd said that. So I think we have a lot of consent um, um, between us. So in terms of technology, uh, obviously, uh, we're living in a wildly changing world of technology. One might even ominously say a brave new world in a way. 
But on the positive side, lots of the technologies that we are thinking about that, that might affect aging have really emerged only in the past 10 years or so, or at least been developed intensely. So computer-based devices, wearable technology, self-driving cars, uh, health monitoring apps, the use of sensors to monitor and diagnose. And I think that the challenge is how we gerontologists, first of all, um, those of us who are in academics, respond to the fact that advances are really being made in the private sector at a greater rate. So perhaps one of the roles for gerontologists and for organizations like GSA is to help people discriminate between the good and the bad and what works and what doesn't. And I would say that there really needs to be a better marriage between behavioral and social science research and uh, technology, because we need, I think, the behavioral science lens as much as we need engineering. Uh, so we don't yet know how older people adapt to a lot of technology, how they use it, and the circumstances when technology is effective and when it's not. So for example, with some of the reliance on e-health creates dissatisfaction in older people. There's still a huge digital divide with a lot of people over 75 not using smartphones or tablets. So we have to understand how to integrate these new technologies into things like family care and social service. And social scientists, I think, and others in the GSA can play a key role in integrating possibly helpful technology into the daily lives of uh, older people. Understanding how they perceive, use, and adjust to technology seems to me an important role for us. Terrific. Anyone else on the panel have any thoughts about technology? This is Kathy Sykes. I'll just quickly say that when it works and all systems are up, it's wonderful. When things fail, such as uh, hurricanes or wildfires, <laughs> or we have to go back to the old way we used to do business. <laughs> that that <laughs> remains for future uh, investigation, huh? Exactly. This is Yanko. What I wanted to just throw in is that, you know, on the same idea about trying to get uh, um, older older adults to um, adapt to things that might be very difficult conceptually sometimes to, uh, to deal with. We are fully at the beginning and I can't predict how quickly this will go forward of the fourth industrial revolution, which will be really the melding of uh, biological, digital, and, uh, and, 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 and physical sciences, whereby many of the things in our homes are going to be drastically different and drastically replaced. Like, you know, they're talking about complete disappearance of plastic from our lives and, and you know, having a very different, you know, eco uh, systems and so forth. And that's going to require also um, interfacing with uh, healthcare providers even more so than ever uh, in, in, a, in a digital manner going forward. So just in a way, I think um, doing education and, and, and preparing folk for those things as well as designing them to be friendly for older adults is both going to be very important. Terrific. Uh um, sorry, uh, Barbara, could I add just, I, I don't want to take too much time, but I, but I did want to say I think that you raise an excellent point, and, and one way that GSA can also be involved is there, of course, in, with these kind of trends, enormous ethical issues involved uh, that we haven't even had to deal with before as we look at these changes in biology, technology, so that I think uh, that that's another important uh, place that some of us could contribute. And uh, before before we move off technology, and I think relevant to much of what we discussed, is also the whole issue of dissemination and implementation of the use of things like new technology and other innovative interventions for older adults. I, I think we have a whole world to learn about that as well, just as an overlying theme. So the next question that came in is, how do health inequities in aging translate across the disciplines? What or how are you seeing this manifest in your work or in the aging field? Kathy, you wrote a lot about this in your report, and I'm going to ask you to start us off on this question. Okay, I, I guess uh, I'll just start with, um, you know, the well-known social determinants of health, you know, that recognize that we actually, you know, 
where we're born and where we grow up and work and live has huge implications in our life. And a lot of these social determinants of health, you know, um, affect us throughout the life course and obviously um, accumulate into our later years too. And so the inequities that um, maybe where we, what neighborhood we grew up in and where we had to work has huge um, implications on our well-being and ability to even, um, you know, go to higher education and get a good job. So we've been having um, policies in this country for years now that have actually been having those with resources have more and those without to have less and less. So just to say that we're on, I think, the wrong trajectory on um, trying to narrow those gaps. Um, and we know that through public policy, changes can be made to actually improve it for all and there's ex examples in, for example, Scandinavia, where they've um, lessened those gaps that were present earlier in the uh, 20th century. So um, uh, a very, um, in a sense, of inequitable or health, um, not just system for people who are of, um, in some cases, uh, immigrants, uh, people of color in this country, where um, they've just uh, been given the short end of the stick. Anyone else on the panel have any thoughts about inequities? Yeah, this is Thomas. So I would say, you know, it really falls in a couple of groups. Um, as Kathy said, you know, and, and it still is true, if you look at predictors of healthcare outcomes, longevity, complications, things like that, probably the biggest variable is your zip code. Uh, yeah. more than your age, more than other things, because it can be predictive of other, a lot of other aspects that are very difficult to measure sometimes, uh, including socioeconomic status, health status, um, and population health. So I think that's a big part of it. And the second is unconscious bias, and we do see that, and it's something that's gotten a lot of attention recently uh, as a topic for people in multiple disciplines to pay attention to, to try to reduce health inequities and, and inequities in care. Um, and I just echo back to the last topic about technology. Um, you know, the advances in technology are part of what have really helped care of older adults. It's made, um, you know, certainly many advances in medications, certainly in surgical care, uh, advances in technology have led to improvements and an ability for some people to maybe have care that they never would have received in the past. Uh, so those would be the things I'd think about. And if Kathy, if I could, can I just quickly say that, that, you know, that it's actually been calculated by the Joint Center for uh, Political and Economic Studies that had we closed the gap on health inequities between uh, 2003 and 2006, we would have saved in direct medical expenses $229 billion. Aha, perhaps more money for research and aging. <laughs> yeah, this is this is Yanko. Just to add to this, usually people, um, you know, when, when thinking about uh, disparities, there is a lot of immediate thought that would go to socioeconomic, behavioral, and other, other aspects. Um, but we also need to understand really biological foundations of it. And uh, there is, you know, an awakening, I think, across the NIH, but in the appropriations, I think that if, you know, this money doesn't move them, the, that, that you just said, uh, you know, talked about, nothing will. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question that came in um, is uh, focused a little bit more on policy. And while the policy webinar, which will be presented next month, will go further into the topic, the question is, how does healthcare financing affect the older adult in your area of research or work? Yanko, perhaps this specifically applies to the biologists in a research capacity. I know you've touched on this a little bit, but is there anything else you want to say to address it? Yeah, you know, I think I think it is a it is a major issue. And, you know, normally in the US we've always had periods of expansion and contraction of funding for federal funding for, uh, for biomedical research and research in general, if you look at the budgets of, of, of the NIH, the, the cycle would usually be about four or five years, there would be a downturn, 
you know, unfortunately, some laboratory, laboratories would close. We would have a little fewer, fewer people going into the training pipelines, but then things would bounce back and, and, and they would be, uh, you know, resuming again and we would reinvest. Um, what has happened, unfortunately, since 2001, uh, as we started fighting several wars simultaneously, um, and then were hit uh, with, uh, with the economic downturn in 2008, uh, we really have not had, uh, uh, we, we have had an effective shrinkage that lasted well over 15 years. And, and that has really uh, cut the workforce almost by a third in, in biomedical sciences. And that happened all at the same time when we were making most phenomenal advances in history, particularly on the side of understanding how plastic and malleable the aging process is and how much we can influence it even very late in life. So uh, uh, that is that is again where um, you know, particularly for for biological sciences, um, losing your lab and having to fire people and then hoping to restart down the line just doesn't work like it would in the small business ever because the workforce is extremely skilled and once you have lost the momentum, it's very difficult to regain it over over you know even even several years. So from that standpoint, you're right. I think that you know the the uh, medical side, but you know also other parts of research are quite vulnerable to to these fluctuations. Sometimes very difficult to convey that to the policy ma policy makers. Kathy, you discussed uh, cumulative advantage and disadvantage in the SRPP trends report. How does that research influence policy decisions made down the line? That's a good question. Uh, the cumulative advantage and disadvantage research um, really provides the evidence to justify changes in our policy, our public policy. And these inequities, you know, start out early in life and they accumulate through the lifetime. And therefore, there's greater inequities that are manifested, you know, in our later years. And po public policy changes are needed um, to help affect people's lives, um, both in early life as well as later life. You know, we're very well aware of all the programs that support older people in later years, such as Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. But in addition, um, we need to guarantee access to higher education and ensure that there's subsidies for health care under the Affordable Care Act. And also, we have to promote affordable housing ownership that would actually narrow the inequities over the lifespan. And if I may just quickly say, in education, when people get college degrees, workers fare much better than those who only have a high school degree. And those jobs not only may pay better, but they often uh, offer benefits such as uh, pensions that, and, and health care that don't come with minimum wage jobs for the less skilled uh, folks. So universal education is critical um, uh, for college. Uh, also, owning one's home um, is, as opposed to renting, really ensures that someone can accumulate wealth uh, over a lifespan. And I'll just say that the Urban Institute said that Blacks and Hispanics are less likely to own homes, so they are often missing out on that powerful um, wealth building tool called home equity. Um, two thirds of home ownership uh, tax subsidies go to the top 20% of taxpayers, while the bottom 20% receive less than 1% of the subsidies. So therein lies one of the inequities. And finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, narrowing the gap on he uh, health inequities is super important. And uh, the social determinants of health are determined by both bi biological, social, cultural, and environmental factors. And we do need to keep uh, the F Affordable Care Act in place and actually expand it to populations not covered and for um, types of services not covered, such as long-term care, to help close this gap. And I'll just mention, too, I can't help but pass by that the Senate voted actually to um, uh, deal with their budget resolution on making more room for tax breaks for the wealthy by cutting $1.5 trillion from Medicaid and mm -hmm. about $500 billion from Medicare to help pay for those um, corporate and billionaire tax cuts. And these cuts, if they're approved, of course, would have huge implications on those with less resources than our elders. Th th thanks for that report. <laughs> uh, in the health science, um, mm -hmm. so, oh, I was just going to 
No, you go ahead. I was going to go on to the next question. So if you have something related to the uh, policy decisions made down the line, go right ahead. Well, I was just going to say that in terms of a great advance to dovetail with Kathy's point, one of the major advances, I think, in social science have been the advent of very long longitudinal studies where now we have a clearer picture of how much, for example, early childhood adversity, childhood poverty, difficulties in adolescence and beyond extend and persist into very late life. So I think that the points Kathy's making are actually really effectively uh, bolstered by a lot of this new, very long-term uh, longitudinal social science research. So I think that that's helping to provide some of the evidence base for these policy ideas. So in the health section uh, report, Tomas, you mentioned the exciting innovations to extend lifespan, but how are we going to balance that with cost? Well, I, I think it's a really intriguing question, Barbara. I mean, um, you know, some of the innovations are life extending, um, but many of them, and I think, you know, where there's been a real strong focus has been pre on preventive care. Um, mm -hmm. So many older adults are now living longer, but they're living healthier lives. Um, you know, and we talked about that um, earlier. Um, you know, we had mentioned that it's not just life extension, but health extension. Um, so I think that that sometimes can, you know, help balance that out. There may not be as much healthcare direct cost associated with people if they are healthier uh, as they age. Now, there are some challenges with that. Um, many older adults are now uh, starting to delay retirement plans and finding that they feel that they may need to work longer in the workforce in order to have enough money for retirement. Uh, so it's affecting some behaviors like that. The other thing that I would put out to think about is most studies show that the largest total amount of healthcare expenditures for individuals tends to occur near end of life. Um, and I think there's been some shift in that over time. I think as we develop better and larger and you know, more involved palliative care and palliative medicine um, and, and work with people near end of life, uh, that may be something else that will help kind of balance out those costs. Uh, but I think the real shift to a uh, healthier life and preventive care uh, is something that's going to help. Terrific response. So longer time optimizing function and a shorter time in those last two very expensive weeks doing maybe more um, le less futile care, more appropriate care. Exactly. Anybody, anybody else have any thoughts on balancing cost? Keeping then with the policy thread, Kathy, what's your take on supplemental security income or SSI as it relates to the major growth of the aging population? Well, I'll start by saying the social security income program is really um, one that we probably know provides monthly income to families who have people who children <laughs> sure. adults disabled and um, or have little income and it has actually been one of the national success stories for lifting so many families out of poverty um, in and what's been a conundrum I think has to do with the fact that um, we have about two million people who are receiving SSI that were older adults in 2008 and that was about the same number as the previous two decades. So it's sort of um, puzzling why that's the case. Um, the older adult population during that time grew by almost 30%, um, but I think that um, it's a successful program and, and needs to be expanded. I, I would go back to, you know, what we need to do is really, um, is a matter of choice and values. It's not a matter of resources. We, we have the will, the political will to do what we deem is important, and in my humble opinion, I think we need to continue to assist those that need the most, as opposed to help those who have it all. So this is Yanko. I just want to add some a little bit to 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 um, the prior question in balancing the cost. <clears throat> if indeed we're successful at um, increasing health span in people by whichever means we do that, 
I would fully expect that many of these uh, uh, folks will not want to stay at home and would uh, rather work, uh, return back to the workforce in some capacity, um, helping shoulder the, the, the societal burden of uh, um, other, other social programs. So let's move from the healthcare financing to health transitions as we see a shift to value-based care and the importance of person-centered care. Carl, could you speak to this shift from your perspective? One of your research areas includes family relationships with staff in long-term care facilities. How have you seen this shift and what does the future hold? Yes, I, you know, I feel like maybe I am uh sounding pessimistic, but I will say that this is one area, as somebody who's worked in the field of trying to do translational research that improves the quality of care in long-term care and home care, I sometimes wonder what I and everyone else have been doing, because a lot of the issues around long-term care still persist that we identified three decades ago, and in particular that we placed the most vulnerable individuals in our society in situations where they're cared for by people who only have a required three weeks of training in order to care for extraordinarily vulnerable people, and they do so under very severe conditions of stress uh, at low wages and low benefits, and that is as untenable a situation as it was. Uh, so I think that we have structural problems in how we do this, that some of these new innovations, although they help, aren't really able to overcome. I do think, though, and especially if there are emerging scholars on this call, really thinking in new and different ways about how we configure long-term care is one of the most, the, uh, the positive pieces, it's one of the most exciting areas in which a person can work. Uh, the new emphasis on person-centered care it seems to have great potential, and the only problem is a lot of these new ideas, uh, there's a very limited evidence base for them. So we have new ideas, but they have not yet been shown to be effective against standard care. So that's something else uh, that really needs to be done. I would say in sum that I think these new ideas are encouraging to focus on the person rather than the institution, but we have an enormously long way to go to bring uh, the long-term care sector up to what a lot of us uh, hope it could become. I, I would second that strongly, Carl, that there is a lot of opportunity and a lot of hope and a lot of exciting things going on. So for, for those of us who have worked in the industry for a long time. Tomas, let's go from person-centered care to a topic you spoke about in the health science section report, which is syndrome-based care. How is it useful in pulling together an interprofessional team? And what are you seeing as the hurdles to increase this type of care? Yeah, again, it's a great question, Barbara. Um, you know, geriatric syndromes are a major um, component of what we deal with in working with older adults. And uh, so just as a brief definition, these are complex conditions uh, that typically have a multifactorial cause uh, and are usually um, needing multiple different types of things in order to provide adequate care and adequately address the problem. Um, some examples would include frailty, polypharmacy, falls, uh, pressure ulcers, those types of things. Um, I would give the example um, from what I do as a urologic surgeon uh, of incontinence. And I think urologists tend to think about incontinence as a diagnosis you know, someone has stress incontinence or they have urgency incontinence or mixed incontinence, whereas geriatricians tend to think about it more as a syndrome. Um, it's a condition not just related to the bladder, but related to the bladder and mobility and cognition and uh, environment. You know, what is their um, home like? Can they easily access the toilet? Is it a safe environment? Is there a fall risk? So that kind of analysis. Um, I think there's been a big increase in emphasis on interprofessional care, and certainly at an educational level, both with our students and our uh, graduates uh, in residencies and fellowships and in nursing and other specialties, uh, there's been a real emphasis on interprofessional education. I think the benefit is all of the different professionals can bring their viewpoint 
uh, to the care of the patient and really provide more of a comprehensive view. Um, the biggest hurdles, I think, have been putting together teams, uh, often at individual sites. Um, you know, everyone's so busy and we see so many people that it can be difficult sometimes to organize those types of teams. Um, and then I think financing and reimbursement have in some ways been a barrier to this. There are some changes that I think are, are happening. Um, you know, now there are some uh, providers that will, or, or payers that will cover, um, you know, telemedicine, for example. Um, I'm involved right now with a multi-center group on a clinical trial sponsored by NIA uh, that's looking at providing group behavioral care uh, and in training for older adults with incontinence. Um, so that could lead to some efficiency and economy of scale uh, rather than having to do everything on a one-to-one -one basis with patients. Uh, so I think really focusing on syndromes uh, can help prevent further decline for patients uh, and may help uh, improve outcomes. T terrific, and I, I would also stress that the interprofessional team may help to efficiently address syndrome-based care. So very exciting way to think about things. Yanko, from your biological science trends report, you say that health is not the absence of disease. Could you dive into what you meant by this? Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> something that I think when you get um, into close um, um, specialization by 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 discipline and by by area, it might be something that we occasionally tend to forget, and that is that uh, our global ultimate goal would be to produce healthy and happy older adults. Um, and therefore, you know, while while obviously I'm chairing biological sciences wearing my MD hat and thinking about health in a more broader context. And there's no doubt that um, the, uh, that touches upon this other thing that I have mentioned that keeps me up at night, which is how do we keep communicating effectively between and across disparate disciplines to, to make sure that we meet that goal. And, uh, and, and that I really believe is one of the, one of the major challenges where you know somebody walking out of a physician's office might be considered in good shape by that particular physician person going back to perhaps less than optimal um family situation or living situation or or, or anything like that you know elder abuse or whatever are all of the aspects that uh, that you know we have to consider it's high time to consider in a, in a more holistic manner Terrific. So it's easy to forget that the vast majority of older people live in less developed nations in which poverty and lack of social security and long-term care systems create the most important threats to well-being and even survival. How can gerontology contribute to solutions to the pressing problems experienced by people in low-resource countries? In Yanko's biological science trends report, he discussed extending the human lifespan into the early hundreds with a commensurate extension of the, of the health span. I'd like to first ask you, Kathy, what does that mean from a social perspective? And then Carl, how does that change intergenerational relationships and life course transitions? Kathy, you want to start us off from a social perspective? Sure. Sorry. Uh, I was on mute. Um, I was <laughs> going to say that I, I know there's been some research that suggests that centenarians are not a prototype, um, but there are some, you know, self-reported uh, similarities among the centenarians. One is that they're very good on self-efficacy. Um, they have a great purpose in life you know, for living, and they have fewer difficulties covering financial expenses, which again gets back to um, my, one of the things that keeps me up late at night about those inequities. I, I think that's what I can contribute now. I think a lot more research needs to be done in this area. Uh -huh. um, so Carl, has, would, uh, yeah, you got it. Sure, I Go would ahead. say, you know, thanks, I'm sorry. I, I think there's a little lag on my 
phone part here, <laughs> so I may be talking over you. Um, you know, I think one of the most interesting things that's occurring right now in the in in terms of human aging that we don't think about very much is what is that we've been in the midst of one of the most extraordinary demographic transitions that we've gone through. It's not just an increase in lifetime, but what's really dramatically increased is shared lifetime in families. So that now we have uh, the majority, for example, of women over 60 still having living parents. And people for the first time in human history can look forward to 30 or 40 or 50 years of shared lifetime as um, with their parents as adults. Uh, and so they have all these all these additional years to enact family roles. So I think that the increase in lifespan really has offers this dramatic change in family life. On the positive side, it means older people are able to contribute in vast ways to families that they may not have been before. But I think the work of Janko and others on increasing increasing health span is critical because the one thing which I will finish by saying is that um, lots of our services and planning are oriented towards the parents of the baby boomers who were insulated from some care needs by having very large numbers of offspring and entering into old age in intact marriages. The boomers are much more likely to have two, one, or zero kids and to be entering later life single. So we're a little bit in an area of what sociologists call structural lag. The population has changed and social circumstances have changed, but our thinking about what family support is hasn't caught up with this very different reality of long lifespans together, but far fewer people in each generation to help one another. So I think uh, that's the important trend that we have to look towards in the future. Terrific. So I, I'm picturing in my mind robot members of the family to help with the caregiving, which is going to extend for, for longer. Yep, yep, we're, we're almost there. It's just a little, as Kathy said, there may be a lot of inequities because it may be very expensive for a while. So each of your trend reports discuss what you find as hot topics right now in the field. If you had a crystal ball do these tre trends change much in the next five to 10 years? And if so, how? How about if we start with you, Yanko, and we'll let each one give us your thoughts about the future, next five to 10 years. I, I think for, for the next five years, um, you know, what I have outlined will, will remain hot and, and, and important. Uh, we touched on one topic that I did not explicitly mentioned there and i believe and, and and those are the that's going to be the research on disparities and understanding disparities from the biological standpoint and i believe that, that will most likely manifest itself uh as as advances in understanding what we call the epigenetic changes the ones that are happening that are not encoded in our genome but that are pr a product of our interaction with the environment that, that's the only other area that I see really, really uh, potentially exploding over the next mm -hmm. five plus years. Uh, and uh, that could be very well what might explain in the end some of the disparities whereby, you know, maybe psychological or psychosocial stress is modifying uh, the biological functions or, and, or, and, or components of the cells and molecules so that they will operate differently. Tomas, how about you? Yeah, you know, I think from uh, an actual care perspective in terms of medications, surgeries, treatments, technology, um, those kind of things, I think we're really on a strong path. I think, uh, you know, we continue to make wonderful discoveries. Certainly the workforce is probably one of the biggest issues that's going to strain the system. Um, you know, we are far behind in training uh, the number of nurses and physicians and pharmacists and therapists uh, that we're going to need to really provide outstanding care uh, to a really growing, you know, rapidly growing population. So I think that's really one of the biggest challenges. And then really, I think the biggest imperative is policy. Um, you know, w we as a country are now so politically divided um, that it's becoming greater, more and more difficult for the legislature to really get anything accomplished. And I think Congress is going to need to come together around health care and find something that will really work. 
um, with the with the best you know in mind for our patients and our providers as well, uh, and trying to keep it from being less political and more focused on what we really need to do for our society. Terrific, and Carl. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I, I come back to technology to say that I think over the next five to 10 years in particular, the explosion in technology makes this uh, the best of times and the worst of times uh, <laughs> in the short run because it's hugely positive, but the danger is that all this new tech, especially in the private sector, is going to involve false starts and honestly hokum. And with the oldest old being less tech savvy and also from other research more amenable to, to persuasion, you could have people misusing it. Um, so that's one. I'd say this: uh, the emergence of new structures to replace the care that family gives is one. And I want to second what Kathy said. I think that in the next decade, understanding the effects of um, environmental assault on older people, given that about two-thirds of people who die in any of these environmental disasters are older people, this is a problem of aging. And I think if there is accelerating climate change. We're going to have to really rethink all kinds of things from where elder facilities are located to how we protect older people from extreme events. So sorry, Kathy, I stole yours, but I really do agree with you on that. No, I think it's great, Carl. May I, Barbara? Go right ahead. Okay, I was going to say, I'm glad you brought that up. I will say that as a retiree, I have a lot more freedom to speak than I did um, a couple months ago. So, um, Carl, I, I would have written my trends report on, on, on the environment, but I was still working at EPA, and that would have never gotten um, out of the agency. So, um, I will say that I, I agree that it's a, a policy um, world that we have that's going to impact our future, uh, you know, uh, eight to five, eight to ten years. Um, and it really deals with Trumponomics and whether there is success in bringing uh, Congress to the table to agree with, you know, block granting our, our, our Medicare, Medicaid program, Medicaid program, um, the, in, the environmental assaults on safety and health are, you know, incredibly um, scary, I guess is the best way to say. And even in, in the nuclear arena, too, with the escalation that has been you know, going on. So for me, I believe, and then the fact that we continue to have the trends of, of um, growing inequities. Um, uh, so that if you're at the top, you know, um, in the top tier, you're in great shape and good future. And if you're in the bottom one, it really does not look so great. Um, so I think we really do have to, uh, you know, put our our um, research policy, a research focused on policy changes to give the evidence for people to uh, act and do the right thing. And then we need to have people uh, take responsibility and show up at the at the voting booths uh, to make sure that the vision and values um, is, is carried out and not um, uh, move us into a place where I don't know how we get out of, you know, when we take away the the laws that deal with protecting the uh, air that we breathe and the water that we drink, that's pretty basic. And if, if we start rolling them back as we continue to, or ignore, you know, the catastrophic, you know, changes that are happening with climate change that this administration refuses to um, acknowledge, it's pretty scary. I mean, I think, you know, I, I thought it was pretty amazing that NPR actually was telling people how to relax and be you know, zen-like because of all of the catastrophes that were happening that were once in a lifetime that were, you know, one after the other. It was just too much to take. So I think we're going to see more of this. It's been predicted. And I think, again, the, the toll it's going to be worth are our elders and those with those fewest resources. Yeah, it, it, and the, the impact of the, uh, the environment on older adults just watching it, particularly when they can't fully understand. So thank you all. I feel as if we may be a little bit short on time for questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to reiterate and really ask folks to take their questions um, to, to GSA Connect and put them up there and ask. Our, our panel will be looking for those and we'll respond so we can continue some of the discussion that way. I think over the hour, we've really covered a lot of information. I know it's uh, made me think, I might feel a little more depressed now than I did coming into it, but I think there's also a lot of really exciting things happening and a really 
uh, you know, I, I, for those of us working in the world of geriatrics for a long, long time, it's really a time when for the first time people are beginning to wake up and say, wow, this is an important area to look at. So I, I think that's something that we can be positive about. A lot of work to do as well and a lot of opportunity. I think we've touched on some of the cutting edge areas of research and practice as well as policy. And I really do feel lucky to have gotten the input from all four experts here. And uh, thanks to those who submitted questions and for those of you who are submitting so that we can continue this discussion. I also wanna take a moment to really thank again our 2017 section chairs for their contributions both today and throughout the year. It was a very different year for GSA given that we didn't have our traditional annual meeting. I look forward myself to reading the 2018 trends reports, which will be written by our incoming section chairs in the coming year. As a reminder, again, this webinar was recorded and will be shared on GSA Connect later this week. To keep the conversation going, head over to the open forum now to, to answer and to uh, submit questions as I've suggested. The next seminar in this series will take place on Thursday, November 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the webinar will cover uh, need to know topics in aging policy. You can register for that online by visiting geron.org slash webinar. Thank you again so much to our panel and attendees today. And I look forward to reading the ongoing discussion and may even post a few questions of my own on GSA Connect. Thank you so much for joining us today.